at the opportunity to deliver a lesson to you. We did not coordinate, although the song we just sang certainly ties into the lesson this evening. Throughout history, specifically with architecture, mankind has used what has been called a cornerstone. These cornerstones were typically placed where two walls came together, hence the name cornerstone. Buildings were often, or these stones were often made of cut, squared rock. Well, what do we mean by that? They would actually square it to where it would be 90 degrees to form a true corner. These cornerstones would unite two intersecting walls and helped align the whole building and tie things together. So it would start in one corner and it would basically draw the lines for those two walls. Uh, oftentimes we today would use a chalk line to show exactly where we wish to put a wall. The cornerstone then would provide strength to these two walls that were connected to it. So naturally the cornerstone was considered extremely important. Oftentimes in importance, important things, events, mankind does hideous things to mark the the ceremony for these cornerstones being laid, oftentimes the Canaanites of old would consecrate their buildings by laying the bodies of children or the elderly beneath said cornerstone. This might shed further light on uh, Joshua chapter 6 verse 26 where a curse was pronounced on Jericho that the rebuilding of the city should not occur. Now since we use concrete today for our most, most of our buildings, our larger structures, the cornerstone, at least the concept of it, has taken more of a ceremonial role. Nowadays the cornerstone will typically display whoever paid for the building, whoever its biggest patron is, or patrons as it might be. It might also display the name of the date of construction or its completion. Usually it's shown by a plaque nailed to the side of the building. But this evening we would like to consider what the Bible says about cornerstones. We see in Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16 that God promised to lay a cornerstone. There it's recorded, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Again, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. <coughs> we must know that no man would actually lay this cornerstone, but rather God himself would do this. This points to the divine nature of this stone, and was prophesied by Daniel and Isaiah. Daniel chapter 2 verses 40 through 44 and 45. And Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 and 3. We see from other scriptures that this cornerstone would cause many to stumble. It would be a stumbling offense to Israel. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14. And Psalm 118 verse 22. These passages are referenced throughout the New Testament, particularly Matthew chapter 21 verse 42, Mark chapter 10 or 12 verse 10, Luke chapter 20 verse 17, and 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. The ISBE page 722 has this to say about these passages. 
These Old Testament passages were understood by the rabbis to be messianic and were properly so applied by the New Testament writers. This is confirmed by inspiration in Acts chapter 4 verses 10 through 12, which reads, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Speaking about a, uh, a man earlier that was healed. Verse 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So the Holy Spirit confirms that Jesus is this cornerstone that God himself laid. Secondly, as the cornerstone, Jesus provides alignment and strength for the building he supports, and that is the church. Just as the cornerstone aligns the walls that it will uphold, Jesus aligns the church by aligning its foundation. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus promised to build his church. No other church was ever promised. Every other church in existence is purely made of man's imaginary, or imagination. Jesus promised to build one church. The bedrock which this promise rests upon is found in verse 16. It is the confession of the fact of the deity of Christ, John 8, 24. Not even death, physical death, or Hades would prevent this church from being established. We know from John chapter 8, verse 28, as well as John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, that Jesus only taught those things that his heavenly Father directed him to. As such, he expected the same from his apostles. Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. You see, Jesus delivered the will of his Father, and in his stead, the apostles were expected to carry on in that regard, to teach only the Father's will. They would be directed by the Holy Spirit to do so. As such, the apostles and the New Testament prophets form the remainder of this foundation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, we find there, it says, Now therefore, Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. This is how it can be properly stated that the church continued in the apostles' doctrine. Acts chapter 2 verse 42. Jesus being the cornerstone, and through his guidance, through the Holy Spirit, the apostles were able to form the remainder of the foundation for the church. Part of this alignment process occurs in the terms of entry for the church. We know in Romans chapter 10, verse 7, that hearing the, the word of God develops faith. The only way to get biblical faith is by hearing or being taught God's word then we must believe, John 8, 24. Then we must repent, Acts chapter 17, verse 30. <clears throat> Next is confession of Christ before others, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And finally, in order to enter into this church, baptism for the remission of sins must occur, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. At this point, and only at this point, is one qualified to be added to the church, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And at this point, this individual becomes a living or lively stone, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And as such, 
said individual is part of God's habitation. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, which states, In whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So each member of the church forms a part of that habitation of God. The church is not the physical walls that we're in right now. The church is the people. And each one of us are lively stones. And we fitly frame together. And we grow, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, we grow up a holy temple. As the cornerstone, Jesus provides strength and ultimately rest. Texas summers are hot. And it's always nice to be able to take a break, maybe get a glass of sweet tea, maybe just plain cold water, sit underneath a, tra a shade tree. Spiritually speaking, it's quite a bit of work to go around. As Christians, we have quite a bit of work to do. For our Lord. Jesus is able to provide us strength. And ultimately when we're faithful to him. He provides us rest. Jesus offers strength. By dwelling in our hearts. Through faith. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 17. And coupled with Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Jesus is the bread of life. John chapter 6 verse 35. And verses 48 through 51. We spiritually feast on this bread through proper reading and study of the scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 15 through 17. And third, as the cornerstone, Jesus provides unity. Just as the solid rock corner provided support and strength, it also united the two walls that it supported. Jesus unites both Jew and Gentile, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, which reads, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This was signified in his death. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 and 51. Mark chapter 15, verses 37 and 38. As well as Luke chapter 23, verses 45 and 46. In these three accounts, or it's the same account, retold three different ways, the veil of the temple was written half. But it was from top to bottom, which signified that Gentiles also had the right to come before God, just as the Jews did. Consider also Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Unity does not stop there. Continued unity is also supplied by Jesus, our cornerstone. In John chapter 17, verses 14 through 21, we see the end result, or the conclusion rather, of his prayer for unity, specifically for his disciples. His apostles are obviously mentioned there, but by extension, us today, Jesus prayed for us, the unity of his disciples. Paul wrote to Corinth that they should be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. This is only accomplished by holding fast the form of sound words. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. This is further solidified by 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Can you imagine if each and every member of the church, the Lord's body, 
actually followed through with this verse, we would have true biblical unity. Such as provided by our Lord and Savior, our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Now Jesus shows us two types of people. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. We sometimes sing this song with the youth, uh, typically on the fourth Sunday, or the last Sunday of each month. This is the wise man and the foolish man. Well, where did the wise man build his house? And where did the foolish man build his house? Spiritually speaking, these are the only two possibilities of mankind. Wise or foolish. <laughs> the wise man built his house on the Lord. The foolish man, as it says, built his house on the sand. And especially when a flood comes through, that sand washes out. Thus the house is destroyed. Now tonight, which one are you? Are you wise or are you foolish? There are only two options. If you've not already rendered obedience to Christ and put him on in baptism, why not do so this evening? We're not granted tomorrow. We're not granted even five minutes from now or another second. Why would you put your soul's jeopardy <coughs> or your soul's survival in the hands of chance? Anything could happen. The world could end. We could get into an accident on the way home. We simply don't know. Are you wise? If so, carry on. Remain faithful. Do your best to be the good example you need to be before others so that they can understand that the way that we walk is far better than the way of the world. Why not have the attitude of Joshua of old? As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Now this evening we have talked about what it takes to become a Christian, to enter the church, to be a, a part of that lively stone building. If this interests you, please take the necessary actions. If you are a child of God already, yet you have allowed sin back into your life, take the necessary actions tonight, repentance and prayer, and you can be restored to being a faithful member of the Lord's church. Whatever the need may be, please make it known as together we stand and sing.